All right, Matthew, welcome to episode 52 of the Performance Advantage podcast. This week, we're talking to world-renowned sports scientist, Dr. Steve Stannard, about his experiences in training with cancer. Also, a bit of a catch-up between you and me, and our new course that we're introducing online. Shout out to the sponsors of the podcast, EnduranceTrainingHub.com and SmartMTBTraining.com, online interactive self-coaching platforms to help you become a better athlete. All right, Matt, what have you been up to, mate? Well... We are in week three of being locked down, and I must say, I'm getting pretty bored. I just really, like, I want to go out and ride trails, and our local trails are closed. We had such amazing weather, such amazing weather. And, um, you know, I think that hopefully the lockdown clears up soon, and we can get back out there, because um, things are looking pretty good here in New Zealand. But now it's starting to rain a lot, and um, over the last week, I kind of haven't really wanted to go riding as much, but then I looked back on my training peaks. I'm like, oh, well, I should probably have a break anyway. So it's been a really good chance to uh, stay inside, drink like way more coffees than usual, and uh, work on the uh, websites. So we are really, really close to launching the Break Ace web app, which uh, has honestly been a long time coming. And it's just really, really, really exciting to see it actually coming together. And, you know, you can upload your data online and click through it and analyze it and all the analysis is there. So for me, like that has been like the most exciting thing. And then obviously working with all my athletes one on one, there have been a lot of changes going on for the athletes where events are canceled and we're changing things on the fly when we weren't expecting to but everyone has been setting like everyone that's testing and uh, now they've all been setting like personal best power outputs uh which has been oh awesome. man is are all your athletes smashing training at the moment yeah, it's crazy yeah same like i am as well it's just there's zero distractions it's been really good to nail down like hey look this isn't working this is like recoveries on point. Uh, there's no like, you know, heading off for the weekend or anything like that, that we need to try and structure things around. And everyone's just like on the grind. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, we, so for some people we had, we've gone back to maintenance phase, but for others it's like, well, this is a good chance to try what we've been planning on. Cause you're planning to be peak fitness anyway. And, um, everyone that we set these new tests up for, they've set new best power output since like ah uh, i really wish there was a race so we could put this to use on the course but you know setting new power output records for yourself and trying new things in training and seeing how that affects you um sometimes with without a race in the way dare i say like you can learn new things and reach new limits and it's yeah it's been really cool it's been like great growing experience for athletes and coach so i've really benefited from it as well yeah there's um like one athlete i work with in particular we we thought that his capacity to train would increase you know now he's, he's um a laborer so you know a lot less stress within the day but actually he was near his limits anyway like we over the last few weeks we haven't been able to he's really broken down like still achieving uh, great outputs, but um, it was super interesting to now apply that moving forward. Like, look, under the best possible conditions for you to train as much as possible, you still broke down. So those limits that you set on yourself for like, oh, everyone else can do it because of this. It's like, well, you, that's not going to work. So now it's like, oh, okay. I, you know, I don't need to, to set those 
arbitrary numbers on my weekly volume um, because I clearly, like, I can't, I can't handle <laughs> yeah, it. Yeah. Um, and that's what I did myself as well. Uh, I set some pretty ambitious training goals for the last couple of weeks and I achieved them, but at, uh, at a pretty big cost. Um, like I've been, as was brought to my attention by my lovely wife, <laughs> it was like, you're way more tired than you normally are. And I'm like, yeah, but I'm trying, I'm trying to really, you know, without so many distractions, push, push myself. And then she goes, well, you know, what if you shifted this and did this, um, within your training? And I was like, no one, especially us, Matt, like we're coaches. It's our job. You don't want to admit you're doing something wrong. <laughs> So as much as I wanted to be like, oh, whatever, I know what I'm doing. I took her advice, just didn't say anything, thought about it. And I was like, oh, she's right. It's actually a better way of structuring my, what I've tried to do. Um, and, uh, yeah, but we've had these opportunities to, to do that, um, to learn about ourselves and our athletes. And, uh, it's, um, you know, it's, it's been great for, for stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. And eventually, you know, the races are going to be back and, you know, hopefully that's sooner than later because we love competing and it's nice to have that carrot dangling in front of you to have a race instead of just always doing trainings. But, you know, this is a great opportunity for everyone to grow and everyone, like, we just need to give ourselves that chance to learn and grow at this time. Yeah. And what we've been able to do, uh, Dr. Matthew and myself is put together a six part online course to make sports science more understandable and more applied for you guys to help yourselves either just learn more or to really help coach yourself. Yeah. Um, this is, this has always been like one of the goals because uh, we can train you and we can give you plans. But one of the things that we do with our own athletes is they pick up information along the way and we eventually make ourselves redundant where actually, you know, it's not great job security, but we teach them so that actually they can do this now, right? They can take the reins. And that uh, learning is something that we really wanted to be able to offer to everyone. So now we're doing it in an easy to digest interactive online format and we pretty much train you to build your own training program and then we have a look at your training program we have quizzes along the way and uh online i don't want to say lectures but tutorials on how to use all the information that we can gather and that um that web page is live performanceadvantagepodcast.com believe it or not we haven't had that but now we have it and uh, you can get all the information about the course there. And for um, another few weeks, we have a 50% discount to sign up for that course. Um, so, yeah, it's actually really exciting to finally be launching this. And this has been an opportunity for us to do it. Yeah, it has been great for that. And this is a good segue, Matt, because you say making ourselves redundant. And that was our mentor. Steve Stannard would always say that as a coach, you should coach yourself out of a job. You should teach athletes how to, you know, understand their training and their physiology. And that's who we happen to have on the podcast today, Dr. Steve Stannard. And amongst a, an array of experiences, uh, Steve has recently undergone treatment for multiple uh, myeloma as and he'll describe that in more detail but why we wanted to get him on was really talk through what a lot of people don't talk about and that is cancer and then exercising with cancer and just his experiences and being a you know very intellectual and highly well read and versed scientist being diagnosed going through treatment and exercising yeah, Steve, um, I don't think he toots his own horn enough. He has, I, I'm not even sure how many hundreds of scientific papers he's authored in exercise physiology. Um, 
We've had him on before, so his kids are all amazing athletes as well. We had his son, Robert Stanard, on the show. He races for uh, on the Pro Tour, road cycling. And um, Steve has a really good way of explaining things. And since this is his own personal experience going through cancer and the, str- the daily struggle that uh, he went through, and, you know, as he goes on to say, it wasn't easy. And, but he's, He's fit, like he's really, really fit, and he um, he was able to bring his fitness back, and um, he attributes a lot of his um, ability to get back to top fitness um, on just being fit in general uh, at the start. Uh, so I think this was a really good chat with Steve, and you know, cancer is going to affect us all in one way, whether we know someone or it's ourselves. And all our audience, they're in, in the training, so I think this is a really good topic. All right, here's Dr. Steve Stannard. Hey, Steve. Welcome to the show. Again. Yeah, yeah you're our first repeat guest, actually. Oh, okay. That's, that's, um, that's nice, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Well, there's no prize that goes with it, but yeah, thanks for coming on. Um uh, <laughs> because last time what we talked about is we talked about uh raising champions and that was ended up being a really popular episode and it was really great to get your input but this time we're talking about something really different and i think you know it's a little bit taboo in a way we're going to talk about training with cancer and not because we want to um It's mostly because we want to kind of talk about the elephant in the room and because most of us will be affected by cancer, whether it's directly or indirectly, and all our listeners are training or athletes or are associated with athletes. So for us to be able to talk about the science behind exercising with cancer from a scientist who exercised with cancer, I think you can offer a really interesting perspective. Yeah, um, interesting. It's a, it's been an interesting journey. Um, yeah, yeah, and I'm I, I'm glad. I'm hopeful that and and the journey continues. I might add. I'm hopeful that I can be um, useful in terms of providing information and um, what's the word a, a a story that gives a bit of support to other people that might be on the same journey. So what, um, we might as well start like from the beginning, like what kind of cancer you have um, and how it came about, I guess, like if it's um, a hereditary one or or how, you know, just the general yeah. background. Yeah, so um, cancer is a big word, uh, the big C. Uh, there's many, many types of cancer. It's a bit like um, saying you've got exercise. <laughs> yeah. We know how many types of exercise there are. There's heaps, you know, there's biking, there's running, there's rowing, canoeing, playing different games, sports. Well, cancer's the same. There's a whole lot of different sorts of cancer. And it really, cancer really describes uh, when there's um, cell, unwanted cell multiplication in your body in some place, um, that can be, and of all the different types of cells in your body, you know, that that cell, unwanted cell multiplication, um, that, I mean, that's why there's many different types. Um, but sometimes that unwanted and unchecked multiplication of cells is harmless. Sometimes it's really dangerous. Um it kills uh, a lot of the time. Um, sometimes you can cure it, sometimes you can't. Sometimes you can manage it, sometimes you can't. I've got this thing called uh, myeloma, which is a, um, a cancer, it's a blood cancer. So it, it, it means I've got some plasma cells, which is one type of white blood cell, um, that um, or, or, or at some point there was a uh, white blood cell in my body or a plasma cell that decided it wanted to keep replicating when it shouldn't have um and it's you know it sort of started to breed like rabbits and and um and what happens is you get a lot of this 
uh, these plasma cells start to um, build up in your blood uh, and it starts displacing the production of other other cells like red blood cells um, the other which means you you know you end up with an, an, an anemia which is a pretty nasty thing to have if it gets really bad um, the other things that happen is these uh, plasma cells when you get um, too many of them they start essentially stopping bone resorption so your bones start getting eaten away like like osteoporosis and um, so it, it presents often or when I, when I say that it often presents as um, a, a bone breakage that doesn't heal or bone pain and people go to their GP and they feel a bit down and um, and there's a bone niggling pain and and it's because their bones been worn away by these excess beta cells in their blood um, which is causing pain so it's a it's a slow grow relatively slow growing sort of a cancer um, this particular type it's, it's sort of a little bit uh, like lymphoma which is a different blood cancer or leukemia which is different blood cancer um, and it's, it, I've got what they call multiple myeloma, which means that it's it presents as a a problem in the bones or where these can these cancer cells in particular, or there's a there's a bone lesion is what they call them. It happens in more than one place. Um, so, and and if you can imagine, you know, uh, compare it to something like uh, breast cancer, which occurs in the breast initially, or brain cancer, which occurs in the brain, um, it's it, it's there in a little spot. Uh, and whereas mine's a blood cancer, which means it's systemic. Some other cancers can also become systemic, of course, which is pretty nasty. So mine starts off as systemic, which means the treatment's quite different. So, you, you know, and, and a skin cancer, you can compare that starts off in the skin often. And, and, you know, I've got little skin cancers, basal cell carcinomas from, you know, too many young years of, 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 of spending too much time in the sun in Australia. But, you know, that, that just is a fairly relatively benign thing that just stays in the skin. So being systemic cancer, myeloma is really hard to treat. So treatment for cancers are uh, obviously very different, uh, and um, I guess we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, yeah. So, but so we were we were working together. We were all at the university at the time, and you know, you were just Steve, and you know, just normal guy, um, always riding, you know, riding pretty much every day. One day you came in and said, oh, yeah, I have cancer. And like for all of us, like that came as a really big surprise because like you were just so active, you're fit, you're healthy. Um, how did how did you notice that? Because we, we couldn't see it in you. We, we just saw the normal Steve. But somehow you found out that you had cancer. How did you find out? Well, sort of two things there I, I'd say is firstly, cancer doesn't choose, and you've heard that before. Um, being physically fit, I don't think in, in many types of cancers, most types of cancers, even perhaps that being physically fit doesn't necessarily make you immune or it doesn't make you immune. Um, that's the first thing I would say. Cancer doesn't choose. Um, so being a person that does lots of exercise, tries to eat reasonably well, um, didn't seem to make any difference. I'll, I'll get back to that though, and I'll, you can ask me later why do you, why do you think I got it? And I'll try and answer it. But um, um, I I only found out, so I didn't get bone pain or anything, uh, but I was in a pretty busy phase of life, pretty stressed. Um, I've probably felt a little bit run down, but every year I get a blood test. Because that's that's the old athlete in me. Get a blood. Yeah, year, that's what you do. Um, in fact, when you, if you're an athlete, you probably should do it once every six months. But once a year, um, it's sort of a you know, it's like taking your car in for a waff, really. Um, and um, I, I, at the time, I was a bit run down, and I thought I was trying to burn the candle at all three ends. And um, I. Um, I thought oh, I was a good time to get a blood test because if there, if there's anything there, it'll get picked up. And I thought. Um, so anyway, I had a blood test and what happens is normally there's nothing, there's nothing untoward, you never hear anything about it again, your GP doesn't get back to you. And this time he said, oh, I want to talk to me about the blood test. I thought, oh, shit, it's my prostate, you know, being at the time just, just about to turn 50. Um, that's, what, that's what every bloke's worried about. 
you know, it turns out it wasn't that. It turns out my calcium was high, my protein was high, um, and they'd sort of been a little bit high in the last couple of years, but one, they both weren't high at the same time. And luckily, I've got a, a fairly astute GP who, uh, where, where where he thought, ah, oh, that's not right, rang up a specialist and said, oh, no, you better send him in. Um, and sent me in, did a pretty much to, to a special, uh, a hematologist, um, he pretty much there and then took a, um, got a nasty big needle and took a sample of um, a bone marrow and uh, and it's got sent away to be processed and, yep, I had cancerous cells in my bone marrow. And uh, that was a bit, um, that was pretty hard to be told, um, okay, you've got cancer and not only that, it's an uncurable cancer because you because like blood, because myeloma, you can't cure it. Um, and so, yeah, that was that was a hard moment. <laughs> uh, and um, that's how I found out. So that's lucky in a way because, you know, I didn't have any, apart from being a bit run down, I didn't have any symptoms. I had no bone pain, which means the cancer hadn't eaten, eaten away too badly, although subsequent MRIs had shown that it had, that it seemed to have um, eaten away a bit in some of my bones. Um, I didn't feel anything. Um, I just, I guess I felt relatively normal. Although I sort of did, and and the thing about the thing about it also is when you're under the weather and when you you know you're about to hit fifty, you, there's expectations, um, and I, I, which I think now are relative are, 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 are sort of wrong. But there's expectations that you know you should feel a few niggles, that you should um, feel a bit run down, that you shouldn't be able to run as fast or do as much as you as you used to. Um, I, I think if you're, I think that's a bit wrong. Um, oh, Steve, you're 50. You should feel some of those things. Well, you know, if, if I had my time again, and I and and or if I if I knew now what I, if I knew uh, then what I know now, then I'd probably think, yeah, something's definitely a little bit amiss because I shouldn't be feeling quite like that. Um, and I remember doing an exercise test with I think it was with you, Will or, or Emma, and uh, my VO2 max was was it had taken a, quite a dive. And um, I thought that's a bit strange, but I must be really unfit. But being unfit before had never really affected my VO2 max much. So when I look back at that, it was probably a sign that my blood was clogging up a bit and uh, my, my, the, my oxygen carrying capacity had, had, had reduced. So that's sort of how it all, um, it all happened. And then, and then, and then as, as, as we say, once it's diagnosed, you get on the train. Yeah, and you. It wasn't. Um, it wasn't super long before you underwent treatment, right? Which um, pretty much knocked you out because uh, you had the um, like it was a very involved intravenous chemotherapy, right? Yeah. Well, see, with with something like I learned a lot about cancer treatment. Cancer treatment is. Um, when you've got a defined, and it's not a common cancer, but it's not uncommon either. Uh, something like one percent of the population have something like this uh, diagnosed or undiagnosed, or, or something. It's it's along those lines. So, th what it means is there's a fairly defined reg treatment regime that you have, and what happens is you know, and this is you know, I'm I'm not a med medical specialist, and, and certainly not an on uh, oncologist or, or or hematologist, but. You know, I gather it works something like this, that, you know, the, the, there's a group of these really well-qualified uh, experts in the area and they get together and they work out the best treatment regime for particular people. Um, and, and it's like a recipe. So when I say you get on the train, um, pretty much you, you get to say, okay, well, you've got this, you have a chat with you. And in my case, it's the haematologist that looks after me. And I've got to say those people at Mid Central are just brilliant. Um, and, and I've, you know, they're, they're great. Um, and, and anyway, um, um, it's pretty defined and they say, well, we're going to do this and this is what you got to do. And it's just, you get on the train and you, you, you there's a certain number, it's, you, you know, you know, it's stopping here and it's stopping here and, or you have to get off here and get on here. And it's just, well, it's just a recipe and you follow it. It's like, it's like, it's okay, I've got a year long training program and, and my, my, my treatment, my training program, so to speak, uh, my train uh, lasted for 14 months. 
um, and and I knew what I had to do for fourteen months. And um, uh, yeah, and they got we got onto it quickly, and and I got the treatment. And um, and again, that's different for some uh, for some people. But but when you sort of get diagnosed, they say they put you in a particular um, category. Okay, we've got a person here of this age, um, first diagnosed at this level. Boom, boom, we're going to do this, 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 and this, and away you go. Um, my first round of treat. I started chemo on my fiftieth birthday. I've got a picture of myself uh, at, at turning fifty, and I had to take a whole stack of pills. So my first one was, I think it was five months of. Uh, injections uh, and um, uh, I, I started a series of infusions but that was about sort of repairing the bone but um, injections once a week and basically pills every day and some pretty nasty stuff um, so uh, that, that does not sound good like it sounds like it's really hard to deal with and I'm just kind of wondering because you talk about this recipe this one-size-fits-all approach yeah. And, you know, that's great that this one size fits all approach was uh, created by experts in their field. So I liken that kind of to like what we do. And I know it, like it's totally different, but we all work with athletes and we work with, with lots of different athletes. And generally speaking, we follow the same principles with most athletes, but we know that if we're working with an athlete and we really want to bring the best out of them, that following a one size fits all approach is not going to work. Right. So that's why we work with our athletes one on one and we look at a broad level of their history. We look at fitness markers in all different aspects along a spectrum of performances. And what we do then as the experts is we devise a plan moving forward that's personalized to everyone. Yeah, now, it I, sounds I, like that doesn't happen with cancer treatment. No, I, I, I sort of say, well, that, well, cancer treatment is changing. Um, it, at the moment, most cancer treatment is is chemotherapy, um, or, or a lot of it is. And, and because I had a systemic cancer, uh, because it was right through me, I couldn't get right, I couldn't get targeted treatment. Like you can't say, okay, the cancer's here. We'll hit, we'll zap it with some radiotherapy. You know, you can't just target it. So you've got to go take a systemic approach. And and the, I liken it to saying, um, okay, I've got dandelions in my lawn, so I'm going to get rid of the dandelions by using Roundup. In other words, I'll kill everything. And then I know I've got rid of the dandelions, but there's been a bit of collateral. I've killed everything else. <laughs> that's 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 chemotherapy. Just just to, and I'll get back to that in a moment. Just to just to sort of further what what happened after the five months is is then they harvested my stem cells, um, and um, um, I had another. I had another. I had actually had a nasty infusion of something, um, and then they harvested my stem cells, and then I had a really nasty infusion of something else, um, uh, malfolin, and and. Basically, it, it's a chemical that was derived from mustard gas. I think um, they learnt this in the First World War, um, and it, kill, it, it basically kills off all your bone marrow. So, I had a, a time, I, and I ended up in hospital in isolation and, um, because if you've got if it kills off your bone marrow, you've got no immunity whatsoever. And um, but the idea is, if you kill off all all your bone marrow, you kill off all these cancer cells as well. And, and so I had this infusion that it was about about three quarters of a gram, only three quarters of a gram of this stuff. And by crikey, does that have a big effect? Amazing. And that's chemotherapy, chemicals that, that are nasty things. And, um, and, and then they put the stem cells back in. And that was what they call an allergenic, um, uh, um, uh, an autologous, sorry, um, um, um uh, stem cell trans transplant and then ideally what happens you've killed off all your all your growing bits in your in your bone marrow where all your blood cells come from uh, you put stem cells back and hopefully they'll take <laughs> you cross your fingers uh, meanwhile you've got no no immunity and and you, you stay there in hospital until they do and then you start a recovery process and the recovery process they told me would take um you know you'd start to feel normal after three months um, so that by that time, 
you know, it was nearly a year later from a diagnosis. Uh, well, that, that's not quite a year later from a diagnosis. And then after that, um, I went on another five months of, of, of consolidation treatment. So the whole thing lasted about 14 months. Um, so that's just, just finishing off what, what uh, where I, where I, what, and that, and it, it, what it's done is a sense, and that was, that was about 18 months ago when I finished that, and um, it, it knocked the cancer back almost completely, but not quite. And that's why they say it's an uncurable thing because it's still there. And, and, and you wait for it to um, get ahead of steam again. Um, a bit like we're waiting for the virus. You're worried about the virus at the moment, uh, COVID-19, <laughs> uh, you, you know, you're trying to, at the moment, I'm in a, you, you're sort of in, in the mode where you know it's still there somewhere in your bones because you can never get rid of it all. Uh, it's hiding there, but um, you, try, you don't want it to come back. You cross your fingers and you think, well, I don't want it to get ahead of steam up. I don't want it to come back. Um, and uh, but going back to the stem cell transplants, exactly what it is. It's it's killing everything off, and then just putting a bit of seed back, which has hopefully got 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 none of the bad stuff in it. The trouble is, when you t- harvest the stem cells uh, initially, you probably get one or two bad ones in there as well. And so when you put them all back, you know, you know there's almost a hundred percent chance you put a couple of bad things back. But you know, it is what it is. Then with your <clears throat> Your fitness level um, and your training regime, like you'd be for your age, you know, in the top one percent of of in terms of like aerobic fitness capacity. You know, your VO two max is in the in the seventies. Um, you're, you know, at the time were highly competitive, like masters cyclists, um, and you've been, you know, world class competitive cyclists. So, like, is that, when I think about it, I think about the amount of damage we do uh, as athletes to our body that requires repair. And we also, you know, have uh, an increased rate of production of reactive oxygen species. And all of this, in my mind, just thinking about it simplistically, sort of would promote like the rapid or increased growth of something that proliferates like a cancer um, and would, and especially within the bone, maybe enhance or increase the rate? Like, do you think your fitness level and the training you were doing was a benefit or a decrement to... You mean the development of the cancer before I knew that I had it? Well, yeah, like if you want to touch on the the development of it and also in regards to your your recovery yeah okay well uh, ask me about the the, <laughs> during the exercise during the cancer and after the cancer just a bit later and it's it's it'll sort of partition that um look i, I you know the part, you, the, the stress that a, a person that exercises hard like an athlete puts themselves under in the short term is is pretty tough on the body um but that's relatively that's a short you know we're talking about competition and even the best people on average might only compete once a week um and then you pretty much start the recovery process the rest of the time in actual fact that that exercise is having beneficial effects except if you really get yourself overcooked and overtrained and i think then that's when you, you you're probably opening yourself up to maybe some more problems um I actually think that being fit um, hid the cancer um, because when I when I've talked to other people about um, um, oh how did you feel when you got got this sort of thing oh I felt a bit run down and you know and um, blah 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 well, I think, well in actual fact you know as an athlete I probably got used to feeling a bit physically run down. Uh, and and not only that, you know, I had a pretty good motor. Um, and when it when I you know I talked early on about you you doing this test on me and it dropped a bit, well, it was still pretty. My VO two max was still pretty good, but it had just dropped. And so I thought, oh, I'm just sort of getting back to being a normal person rather than being an athlete. <laughs> now. And and 
Oh, actually, that's the day. It, it, that's that's good and it's bad because what it meant was uh, it was bad because I. It's much harder to pick up something that's, especially by the medical profession, uh, profession is is seen as. Uh, in, a, in a sort of a deleterious or a sick state, when you're an athlete, it's a lot harder to get into that physically sick um, state. I don't know, I'm not talking about infection, infectious type stuff, but um, the but the other side of of the so that was the bad in a, in a way in a bad way of being fit. It's a lot harder to notice when you have got something like this. But in a good way, what it meant was that, that I had a lot of more robustness to my bones and and probably my kidneys and stuff like that so they didn't get damaged um and you know and and yeah so you know in one way I was lucky in another way perhaps perhaps not um I think that's answered answered your question yeah so, yeah. yeah um so yeah then what about Jim? training afterwards well when you oh yeah during during treatment during, so well, i know because we, I know we you, rode yeah you also had the um you had some steroid you know one of the steroids that they um have talked about with being you know um something that that athletes in particular corticosteroids yeah, so and, I had some pretty heavy doses of dexamethasone dexamethasone is a corticosteroid um, and you know, I think some of the some of the uh, elite endurance athletes have used corticosteroids to uh, um, improve aspects of their performance, or uh, it basically re um, it reduces inflammation. Um, and it, <laughs> but it was pretty nasty. And when you take really high doses of this stuff, um, it, it 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 yeah, it gets it gets pretty nasty. What what I after you get over the, the initial shock, and it is a shock of, of cancer diagnosis, and and I'll, I'll tell you what, it's it's a life changing experience. Um, walking into the oncology ward, not as a visitor, but as a patient, that's 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 a that's a real really that's a life changing experience. Um, you after the initial shock of doing those sorts of things you get you get into this mode of determination you get on it's part it's part of it's part of getting on the train okay we're on the train and we, let's do this and you just bloody well do it and um okay i'm going to get up going to exercise because um although no one's told me that i should exercise or that i shouldn't exercise my gut tells me and my education and experience tells me that I've got to keep physically active. Although there is a bit of scientific literature out there saying, you know, okay, you should be, you, you know, it's good to keep some exercise going when you're treatment. But I tried, okay, well, I'm just going to try and stay fit, get up and do cycle, ride my bike every day. I'll even go hard one or two days a week. Um, at the time, I, I was trying to get up because um, by that time I'd started to take sick leave um i, I you, you got to, you know, sort of had to be at the hospital a couple of times every week so you you, you get quite busy but i thought i'll try and get a regimented life i'll get up first thing in the morning before it's light go go running come back uh i still had, i was still doing a little bit of stuff at the coffee shop i'd still go and open up to have a semblance of normality um and then i'd come home so i'd have a just try and have a bit of a rest uh and then i'll hop on my exercise bike and away i'll go again then i can go to the hospital in the afternoon or whatever um and, and i and I started off with a hiss and a roar, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. And I started to fall to bits pretty quickly um, because I realised pretty quickly that um, you can't keep doing the same level of exercise that you think you should be able to do. What you, they've got these things called performance-enhancing drugs, right, um, <laughs> Called and and they're often they're based around stuff like testosterone, uh, growth hormone, all the things that promote cell growth and recovery. When you start doing chemo, they're called performance killing drugs because the idea of those drugs is they do exactly the opposite. They're stopping cells growing. So you, you go out and you try and exercise when you're on these cancer drugs and you don't recover because that's what the drugs are doing. They're essentially not allowing you to recover. Anti-inflammatories, um, and, and most people know these days, sports scientists know that if you take a whole lot of anti-inflammatories, it, 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 it slows the recovery process. Um, so I was taking performance uh, killing drugs. Uh, 
I tried to keep exercising and, and it got to the point where I just I got crook, ended up in, um, in ED with an infection. Uh, I lost seven kilos and then I was just stuck on the couch watching bad movies for a lot of weeks. <laughs> um, so, um, yeah. yeah it, do, you re do you remember um, we had you come in the lab actually a bunch of times? Yeah. maybe four or five times and one of the things that you were kind of saying is you were wondering how your fuel utilization was changing as you had started these different chemotherapy drugs and there wasn't yeah. really any literature on it so what we did so just so everyone knows you you came into the lab and we just had you exercise at uh, different power outputs on the on the bike I think it was maybe 150 200 250 300 watts for five minutes for a lot of people you know that'd be pretty hard but and you were on chemotherapy and you were fine and we were collecting you know heart rate and we had you hooked up to the metabolic cart and then a few times actually you would follow that up and do like a max test like a proper vo2 max test that we only did that one a few times because um I felt I felt bad like I didn't want to put you through like this you were pushing it and um unfortunately I lost the results I can't find them they're here somewhere <laughs> but um do you remember uh kind of what you were thinking what you wanted to look for when we were looking at that data and maybe some of the things that had changed yeah well what I was interested in is is that uh, the, so going back to my story about exercising no one had told me what I could and couldn't do and you know, I, being a scientist, I wanted to, I went to the literature and, and so, so when, when you get diagnosed with this particular cancer, no one says, well, you need to go out and exercise or you shouldn't exercise. I think they just say, well, you should keep up some sort of physical activity and go and walk around the block or go and pick the paper up. Well, that's not exercise in my book. Um, so I, 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 I wanted to try and keep doing stuff, but there isn't any literature there. I mean, and there's no information. There's nothing in the literature at all about, for instance, the effect of a high dose of dexamethasone on exercise capacity and all, probably of all the things I was taking that had the most acute uh, daily sort of effects so to give you a higher to drop you at a drop you after you you know I was four days on four days off and when you, you'd feel fine when you're on it but when it dropped you it dropped you and um, um, there was really nothing at all so I, I think that's what we did we, we we went in and had a look at you know what happens when you start dexamethasone and what, what happens when you're not on dexamethasone and my memories are bizarrely fuel selection was all over the place, um, which sort of doesn't, well, bizarrely, you know, I mean, because the numbers were very strange, but I suppose I shouldn't be surprised because it's pretty nasty stuff. You know, 40 milligrams of, of dexamethasone every day, um, it was, was pretty solid. Uh, and, um, you know, it's... Uh, bound to have some effects and on top of that there was all sorts of other stuff I was taking so um but but yeah during, during I mean obviously I still had the capacity to exercise like you say I still could do that and some days you could and some days you couldn't um but as that first before the stem cell transplant as time went on um I, I came to the realization that I couldn't um I couldn't keep functioning at the same physical level as I did before you just you just can't do it because the drugs don't allow you to recover. You just get into a hole, and if you then you just if you keep trying to exercise, you just keep digging the hole bigger. Yeah, you can really see the difficulty in scientists and doctors trying to prescribe some sort of exercise to some sort of exercise regime for when you're going through chemotherapy, especially if you think about the pop most of the population. Uh, they're not going to be as fit as you and, or as motivated as you to stay fit. So here you have someone who's really motivated to stay fit, is already really fit. They start chemotherapy. This is you. And it's really hard to keep up an exercise regime. Um, you know, And yours would have been at a higher level than they would probably prescribe to anyone, especially someone who's coming in unfit. But you can see really the difficulty that scientists would have in actually testing uh, a sort of exercise protocol just because of how difficult it was. So it's really hard to get a, uh, a conc some concrete evidence of how effective and beneficial exercising was for you and how beneficial it could be for someone else. 
Yeah, well, of course, the benefits of exercise are not just physical, they're mental as well, and, and that's a big thing. You know, you, you, you've you got to sort of look after your mental well-being just as importantly, perhaps more importantly, um, when, you, when you're coping with, with chemo, but also as, as a means of trying to battle a cancer and recover. Um, yeah, what you know, I often, I often thought to myself, there was the odd time, and this is let alone after the stem cell transplant, which you might ask me about later, is where I was um, in that first round where I, I remember getting up one day, right, I'm going to go for a walk. And I, I, I almost didn't make it round the block. And in fact, I don't think I made it round the block. And, um, and I'm thinking to myself at this point, okay, look, I'm pretty fit. You know, it was only a couple of months ago, I'm, I'm ticking along at four minute Ks. I'm, and now I can't walk around the block. So how would someone who's, um, you know, a cancer patient who's never exercised, um, who's, um, yeah, how, how would you then say, oh, you need to keep your exercise up in cancer when I'm thinking I can't walk around the block? Um, it's, it's a tough one. Like, so, yeah, it's a tough one. Um, but the, the evidence does seem to show that it's, that it's exercise in some fashion is beneficial, you know, during treatment. And, and treatment's treatment. People respond differently. Some, you know, and there's different, absolutely different levels of, of um, different levels of treatment that people respond differently to. So, um, but, you know, just a blanket statement like, I'll oh, keep exercising during your cancer treatment, I think is, is, is naive at best. What about diet then? Did you get recommendations on that? Yeah, see, this is, um, you know, it's really interesting. The only recommendations I got in terms of diet were um, you're not allowed to eat grapefruit or green tea because it interferes with the with the chemotherapy. And I'm thinking, well, I wonder what other things interfere with the chemotherapy, but they've just never bothered to study. <laughs> and How did they find that? Oh, because someone just decided to do an experiment, you know. Oh, because someone someone found uh, that grapefruit affected, um, I think, heart medication. So, oh, we'll just try, we'll try, we'll do that experiment on chemo drugs to see if it does the same thing. Well, geez, if grapefruit do, does it, I wonder what, uh, you know, figs do or, or tahini does or yogurt. I mean, who knows? And and But anyway, I did what I was told. Um, <laughs> is McDonald's and, good? Hey, Mc, McDonald's is good? Well, yeah, I mean, I wasn't. You, you do, you do, you do, you do uh, keep a bit of sensibility. But I just tried to eat relatively healthy. I mean, there's sometimes um, when you just, you know, the cancer treatment affects your, you know, your your your, your ability to take in food. When after I had my stem cell transplant, like I like I said before, that you know, three quarters of a gram of malflon uh, basically um, basically kills your gastrointestinal tract for a, a wee while as well. It just takes takes all the dividing cells away. And I, I think I didn't eat anything for a week. I, I, I mean, there was times when I, you know, you just couldn't face looking at anything. Um, and then after about a week, I managed to eat a, an old orange. It might have been more than a week. And it was like, shit, that was really good. I managed to eat something. And then it takes you months to get your appetite back. And you know, that's just my treatment. People are having different types of treatment all the time. So what, you know, it doesn't become down as you shouldn't eat that or you shouldn't eat this. It's like, well, what, what actually can I get down my throat? Because at some point you need energy of some some sort. Um, and, um, you know, and, and I think that's where lots of, the medical side of cancers, it, it's they concentrate on. It's more about what you eat, uh, the, the being able to eat, than than, than um, uh, not what you eat. That's not saying what. That's not saying that what you eat is not important because it's vitally important. It's just that we don't really know. So, I just tried to eat relatively healthily. Um, just interesting. You know, I remember I, I lost seven kilos uh, in the first uh, five months of treatment through stress and through probably not being able to eat and, and times and, and what have you. And, and then one, one of my, my GP said to me, Steve, you're losing too much weight. You need to, need to put some weight on. So my daughter went and just baked me uh, uh, cookies with tahini and chocolate and I ate some of those and put a bit of weight on, which was good. Um, and, and, and I remember saying that, and I was saying, look, you know, at the hospital I, was, I, I said, well, they, they had to inject uh, into my um, body fat and they couldn't find any at one point. And, <laughs> yeah. 
Um, and, and, and they said, look, you know, here we want people to put on weight. We like weight. We like fat. They love fat in, 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 in the oncology ward. Um, so, you know, the sort of a lot of the normal sort of um, nutrition things are, are quite different in a medical sense. Um, but what about, um, I remember we spoke uh, about like a ketogenic diet or ketosis. Uh, yeah. Did you look more into that? Because from my understanding, cancer cells are, I guess, um, horribly inefficient. So they they are, um, have a really bad uh, or disjointed electron transport chain and oxidative phosphorylation. So a lot of the, uh, uh, the metabolism is anaerobic. It's glycolytic. Um, so the base theory suggests that if you starve yourself of glucose um, and replace with ketones, then that in effect starves the cancer cells. Yeah. Were, were, you, were you advised on anything like that? No, no, there's nothing like that. I see one of the things is there's no, there's no research. That, that you only get advised by the medical profession where there's good evidence. And that's that's sensible. Um, there's there's and, and evidence relating to that cancer. So there's no good evidence yeah. that changes in diet at all affect multiple myeloma. Uh, I think that, you know, in contrast, there's probably some evidence that um, things like breast cancer uh, can be affected by diet uh, in some way, in a broad sense. Um, whether or not the research has been done on ketogenic diet, certainly in in rodents or animal studies, I think that there's some evidence that. Uh, things like ketogenic diets can um, can reduce tumours and things like that. When you're doing a stem cell transplant, you can't eat for uh, uh, at all anything for a week, and then for the following months, you can eat limited amounts of food. You let me tell you, you're in a ketogenic state at that point. I think I was in a ketogenic state uh, uh, many oh, yeah. during during the um, and and I, I don't doubt that that could could. Be, be beneficial and certainly now and you know later on uh, it could be beneficial um on the other hand um you've got to uh, you know i, I and i try I've, I've, since i've tried exercising I, I mean i still think exercise is really important for trying to keep the cancer at bay and just general health and fitness and well-being it's pretty hard to exercise when you're in starvation um and uh, and personally i'd prefer just to starve to go ketogenic rather than um, go on a, a longer term diet, but I, I also decided that I was better off. I was I was better off looking for really natural foods. Um, this is in 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 recovery uh, from the stem cell transplant than than trying to do anything ketogenic. Not that ketogenic was would be bad. I, I don't think, but um, I thought well, I'm look better off looking for things like anthocyanins, coloured vegetables. Uh, really natural stuff and and really natural so that I just go out the garden and pick it off the tree uh, and that that's what I felt you know and I did a bit of research as, as to you know what the 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 bench top studies and and what sort of um, uh, are said in terms of particular nutrients uh, might be useful um, you know without human trials and stuff like that and 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 what sort of foods contain those and you know, it was fruit and vegetables and what have you. And the trouble is you can't eat a lot of fruit and vegetables and be ketogenic. So that's what I decided. It's a bit of a rabbit hole though, isn't it? When you start searching online for these different homeopathic remedies for cancer, there are all these broad claims for all different kinds of things that this helps cure cancer and that helps. Did you find yourself like, searching things on google or webmd and things like that and coming up with of course of course you do you got you got to because actually knowledge is power when it comes to cancer it is um home homeopathy is a different ball game and i haven't touched <laughs> that that's the but um you do and and but if it means that oh okay you know you know there's um um particular ant sign that, you know that's been shown to help a little bit in terms of killing cd38 proteins which help myeloma cells proliferate uh, in a petri dish and it's in apples, well, then I'm going to eat apples. I'm not going to go overboard, but I've got an apple tree. Why wouldn't I? Um, and and that, that was the approach that I took, um, you know, and, and um, you know, with, without, without further knowledge or without the clinical trials being done, that's all you can really do. Um, you know, I haven't gone overboard on anything. Um, 
I had an Easter egg the other day and I feel guilty <laughs> about it. Um, but then maybe you did too, I don't know. I did, I did. <laughs> um, so, but overall, you were prescribed your treatment and outside of that, there was nothing that, there's no other recommendations. No, not really. Um, not really. That, that, you know, it's, and that's modern medicine, really. Uh, you'd be prescribed the treatment based on statistics, uh, based on weight, statistics and weight of evidence, um, and, and, and on what experiments that have been done. No one has done an interventional trial on the effect of exercise and multiple myeloma. No one's even done it on, as I said before, taking dexamethasone. There are enormous holes in the, in the body of knowledge about cancer, exercise, diet, the whole gamut. Um, it's the, you know, uh, we just don't know. It's, that's just how it is. Um, so you, you, you've got to take charge and try and, this is why knowledge is power, try and work out for yourself what's best. Can I, if I can digress a bit, I think, I think you know, I'm, at the moment I'm ticking along pretty well. Um, and my treatment was not 100% effective. Like I say, the cancer's still there in the background. It's still there. Um, but it, was, it went reasonably well. And I think a big part of that was reducing stress, you know, and, and um, reducing stress I, I felt was really import, a really important part of dealing with this. Uh, and and not only from a, a purely psychological sense, and I'm not a psychologist, and I, so there's no expertise there. What I learned was when you take something like dexamethasone, and there might have been something else I was taking, it's an anti-inflammatory. So you're taking anti-inflammatories because cancer cells love an inflammatory environment to, to proliferate, right? So, but stress causes inflammation. And in, in an acute sense, exercise causes inflammation too, doesn't it? Inflammation. Yeah, yeah. Um, but um, the thing about being fit, the, the, the acute exercise causes inflammation, but when you recover from that and you do really quickly, you, your, your systemic basal levels of inflammation are much less. Yeah, it's very uh, acute. It's not chronic like not chronic. Um, yeah, so a lot of other stress. Chronic inflammation is really bad in, in a whole lot of ways. I think we're, you know, we're finding out more and more about that, about that all the time. And, um, and, and, you know, going back to, I think I said, you need to ask me, what, why do I think I got this in the first place? I think partly just chronic stress. Yeah, I was about to ask that, like, because it's non-hereditary as far as I understand. Pretty much. Well, get, I'll get back to that. But, um, you know, when you take, when you take some of these, well, so taking some of these pills, all I'm doing in, in a way is, is using chemotherapy to reduce the effects of stress. So why don't I just take out, take out the stressful um, factors in my life anyway. And so I quit my job <laughs> pretty much or I, or, or I wasn't there. So the best thing I did was not be at work because I found that quite stressful. And that was, um, and, and also, and then having, making time to sort of try and relax, I think was important. And when you when you talk to cancer survivors um, uh, or you read the books, what they say is you're trying to reduce stress, have time to meditate, and that's all about reducing inflammation, reducing stress. And so if you can do that as well as take the anti-inflammatory drugs, it's probably a good thing. Exercise is really important because it reduces systemic inflammation. And, um, uh, you know, they don't tell you that, but I had to work that out for myself. So that's why I, partly why I tried to keep exercising. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so does that, that's how you think in your case, the cancer came about? Uh, I, I, look, you, you, never, you never know. I mean, there's, there's genetic factors, there's environmental factors, and but I certainly think stress has a big part to play. Um, you know, I had quite a few years of, of, as I say, burning a candle at all different ends. Um, and so physical stress, but I think there was aspects of mental stress in my life um, that, I should have seen, and, th and but the trouble was, I, I I think you there's an expectation, and again now when I look back, it's really wrong that a job has to be stressful. Yeah, well, like your it was Shouldn't not uncommon for us to get you know an email from Steve at three a.m. 
Yeah, um, and that was because I'd get up in the middle of the, the middle of the night, stressed about something, and you think, okay, well, I'm up. I may as well just um, work. And you'd write a paper or something like that, and you'd and that um, and the danger is that becomes normal. Oh, I'm up. I may as well just do something, and and then you try and stay up, or you go back to bed, or then you have three cups of coffee to try and stay awake later in the day. And that starts. You look back on that and you think, well, that's not entirely healthy. I mean, if you enjoy the coffee and <laughs> you know that's all right, but um, you know, uh, uh, yeah, uh, and the troubles that then became normalised, and uh, and I thought it was normal. I just thought that was part of uh, life in in a fairly stressful working environment. I just thought that's what you had to do. I, I, I so wish I knew then what I know now. It's not normal. No, I remember seeing like the amount of things that you were doing and <laughs> still like riding more than myself and you have a family and um, you had your own business. You had a full-time job at the university. I couldn't believe how much you were actually doing in a day. It just blew my mind. And it, it sounds like that you know, became normal for you, but it also wasn't easy. Oh, it was very stressful. Uh, you know, I could tell you some stories about having to get up at 1 a.m., drive one of your kids down to the airport to um, get on an international flight, drive home, go to go, go to work um, in your lunchtime, go down and make sure that the, the cafe wasn't burnt down and then uh, finishing work, going to the cafe, cleaning up and going home and, and trying to get up again and do some exercise before breakfast the next day. And that was just normal sort of stuff. But, yeah, I just thought it was normal, but it's not normal. No, it's, <laughs> it's not. Um, and how, like, in terms of exercise, I remember, yeah, like sometimes you could barely push the pedals over. Um where are uh, your 18 months, almost two years, uh, I guess? I'm on. 18 months after my last round of chemo. Yeah. Um, and like you're still racing. I was. Uh, see, I, it's not, it's, it hasn't been all beer and Skittles. Um, I have periods where I'm, it, it, chemo is pretty nasty and it takes a while to get over uh, when you stop. It takes quite a while for it to. To, to get over its effects. I mean, and, and probably I never will. Um, I think there's probably some damage, pretty nasty stuff, some some permanent damage that's been done. Um, one thing that I have had a problem with is I, 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 I can exercise for a while and then I get run down really easily. I, I've been, um, yeah, I get run down really easily and I think that's possibly because I, 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 I get... Um, panacious anemia now. I, I'm trying to investigate it with help from a doctor about why I get so run down quickly. I'm not, not on top of it, but there's long-term effects of, of undergoing a stem cell tr transplant, which means that, you know, I'm, I, I, you know, my, the gone of the days of my VO2 max getting over five and a half litres per minute, you know, and, and um, it, it's, um, it's, it's just how it is. Um, you, you're just more fragile. Uh, it's, are, are you building? Are you building fitness? Can you get? Oh, look! I can't again. Uh, the maintenance. Yeah, uh, and it's a longer story. I mean, I've just been through a period of of I started uh, racing again, uh, doing some last year, um, and I, I, I started racing in three months after my stem cell transplant, and I was going okay. But what happens is you you just end up getting run down really quickly, and I'm trying to investigate exactly why. It could be just that's just the new me. Uh, it could be a nutritional thing. Uh, I think it's possibly I'm, I get anemic really easily now because I can't absorb B12. I don't know if that's the case, but um, it seems to be possibly what the problem is. I can get pretty fit, I, 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 um, but I can't hang on to that fitness. And then I've got to just park it for a while and recover. It just, I seem to get overtrained really easily now. That's, 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 that's what seems to happen. So I can't build fitness all the time. It's an up and down process. But like you're still like pretty fit and you got fit again really, really quickly after your treatment. So yeah. can, could you give us an idea of maybe some numbers of like how your threshold 
dipped and then came up and oh, like, like when, when i okay from when you had your stem cell transplant um you know you hit vo2 max by getting out of bed and walking up and down the hallway basically i couldn't you know i struggled to climb a set of stairs without someone's help um three months later i was out oh, i think i probably run one one my age group the club championships i could do inter clubs um i was i was knocking out some pretty good no seriously three months later i was knocking out some okay times in the local club time trial um i i think last the end of last year, I even um, I've got to remember I got other. I still got busy aspects of my life, and I don't always have time to ride. But I, even at the end of last year, I managed to knock out uh, my fastest time for about four years in the local club time trial. But so this is from before I got the cancer. Um, but I just, you know, then I have I just have a down patch, and away I go, and I've got to lose fitness and recover a little bit. Um, I reckon the stems, the whole stem cell transplant, in terms of my threshold, has probably knocked about. Talking numbers, it's probably knocked about um, over the space of it. Let's let's say four years, because you know that probably, yeah, probably about four years. I reckon it's I've lost about sixty watts off my threshold. That's pretty substan substantial. Um, yeah, because it would have been. What about three fifty? Oh, no, a bit more maybe. I, I mean, if I think about what I could hold in the twelve k time trial, so about eighteen minutes is probably about three hundred and eighty. And then you know, if I if I, if I could hold three hundred and twenty now, I'd be pretty happy. Which is a, it's a, which is a, a little bit hard. You take. you what about seventy seventy kgs? Yeah, yeah, about seventy one kgs or something like that. So. Um, that's that's just how it is. I, I don't, you know, it doesn't doesn't it actually doesn't worry me at all. It's it's, it's a bit dis, disheartening to to see what you could do, and what you can, yeah. Put it this way, I've I've checked my calibration on my power meter a couple of times. <laughs> yeah. I remember going over to your house. You thought your power meter was wrong, so we yeah. hung a weight off of your yeah. pedal just to recalibrate it. We had to hack into the system just to yeah. check. But yeah, you know. I think that like really shows that like you you pretty much you were at this really really high level and you were pretty much down to zero fitness and actually I'm sure it wasn't easy but it didn't take you really long to get back in the mix and become like a local hotshot again and like you're really fit so no no matter where you were like you'd still be competing competitive um definitely in your age group and you know for the record you still jump in the local criteriums in the middle of the week and you ride with the elites the a grade so i think you know it's really inspiring to kind of show that you were at a high level you were down to zero and quickly you made it back to a high level again not yeah, as high as you'd like to be but yeah so that was i think that was that was a, that was the benefit of being fit so when, when other people were talking about it took them a month after the stem cell transplant to walk to their letterbox i was walking to the letterbox in a week in a month i was out doing 50k rides and in three months i was out doing interclub races whereas people were still struggling to walk down and get the paper that that's what being fit going into it uh, that's what that's what it does. It, it, my my recovery was far, far better. Actually, it was even interesting when I had my stem cells harvested. You know that you go in and you basically go under dialysis, and um, that the, they hope they can get enough stem cells in one go at it because it's pretty. It's a pr bit of an ordeal. You know, lying there in the bed for I don't know, seven or eight hours with a couple of steel needles in your arm, you're not allowed to move, and especially if you want to go to the toilet. <laughs> It's difficult, and you don't want to go through it again. So you think, oh, God, I hope they've harvested enough stem cells. But when they, when, when they, otherwise you've got to go back and do it again. Shit, I don't want to do this anyway. When they did mine, they harvested enough stem cells for five and a half transplants, <laughs> <laughs> which was like, well, you didn't need to take so much out. But I think partly that was whereas whereas a lot of people they've got to go back because they only get enough for half a transplant. And 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 so for me, I think being fit helped with all of those processes. Absolutely helped. Then what would you, 
like what would be your recommendations? What would be your like there's people suffering from cancer every single day? Like what what would be your words to them around uh, kind of anything really? Uh, well, the first one is I take you got take take the glass half full approach. Um, could you could have I'm sure like you say it um I was there when you were going through this. So as Matt, you, you say, oh, yeah, and uh, one month and then three months. But those that three months took every single day of every single, you know, there was hours of the day where it wasn't just like, yeah, click of the fingers were three months in. You had to work at it. You couldn't just in three months be fit. Um, you know, nothing gets given to anyone, but you had to want to get back there right yeah you do you've got to take a glass half full approach and think yeah yeah you got to you got to sort of be determined um you got to say okay this is where i'm going this is what i want to do and you you can't i, I think you know they talk about you've got plans you've got to be strong what i learned was being strong was it's saying okay well you know being strong it's 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 about saying okay well i know that you know going for a walk around the block's going to be good for me and i feel shit but i've got to get up and do it that's that's being strong. It's 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 um, you need physical strength. You need mental strength to do that. And you've got to say, okay, I'm going to try and have a crack at you know beating this. And and in my case, I can't completely beat it. Probably can't, but I can damn well make sure I'm having a having a doing doing the best. And you've got to you've got to do that mentally. Um, you've got to have this uh, attitude of of um, yeah, you know. I can do this or um, it's the glass half full approach, not, oh, woe is me, I can't do this. You can't have a defeatist approach. I'll tell you a little story. You probably want to wind it up, but I'll tell you a little story. <laughs> of, of um, I, I went in there uh, one time. I was in the hospital in the oncology ward and it was, it was when I had to go in. I'd just done this course of injections to mobilise my stem cells before they got harvested and then I had to go in and, and they took a blood test first thing in the morning to see whether I was ready to get them harvested. And I went in one morning, I took a blood test, it took an hour or something to get the results. And meanwhile, I was just waiting there in, in oncology and a bloke had come in with the drip hanging out his arm, his dressing gown. And I had a chat with him and I said, oh, you know, what are you in here? As you do, you know, well, what are you in here for? Oh, yeah, I'm in here. I'm just waiting for my... Um, I've got myeloma and I'm just waiting for my um, stem, uh, stem blood sample to get processed before they tell me I've got to get my stem cells harvested. Um, and, and I said, to, and, and, and I asked him, yeah, what are you in here for? He says, oh, I've got bowel cancer. He said, oh, uh, and, and, and um, or I'm doing treatment for bowel cancer. And, yeah, I've, I've, um, I've, I've had pneumonia, so I've been in here for like, you know, two weeks or something. And I'm just getting over it, which is good. And I said, he, and I said oh, I had, you know, you had that. And he says, he said, I was lucky, he said. He said, I, <laughs> this guy, he said, um, I was lucky. I got diagnosed at stage three. And I said, if I'd, got, <laughs> if I'd been diagnosed at stage four, I would have been fucked. But, um, <laughs> you know, and, and I thought, shit, you know, and I've, here's me, got diagnosed with no symptoms at stage one. Um, and this guy's got the glass half full and he got diagnosed at stage three. I haven't seen him since. You know, he had a couple of young kids and, and that, and, um, but he was a, um, a real example and, and um, that's how you got to be. Sweet. And probably just the final question um, I'd ask would be, how has it changed your outlook on life? Like you're only 51 now, 52, early 50s. Um, what's like, are you reducing stress? I know you uh, run a UCI level two race, a cafe, have three kids and a rental property. <laughs> oh. Um, um, has it, so what was the question again? Have, has it changed my, how, how do I, has, has it, how has it changed my life? Um, I, I've, my, I've certainly reduced uh, stress. What I and I look for opportunities to try and reduce stress. Um, that's really important. I don't do as much. I try and find quiet time every day. Um, I, I, um, I guess 
I'm less likely to suffer fools gladly. Um, I say I don't like people wasting my time. Don't waste my time because I don't know how much time I've got. Like seriously, I don't think I could go back and work at the university. There's too many time time wasters there. <laughs> um, you know, I don't, don't waste my time, and and that's that's you, you become a bit like that, um, a bit more politely brutal. I I would say. Um, that's fine. I drive a really old um, Land Rover, um, which you've seen. Um, it's like a tractor. Um, it does naught to 100 in 50 seconds. In fact, it doesn't even reach 100, so that's probably a, in, in infinity. <laughs> um, and the beauty of that is that that was actually quite therapeutic. I was driving that one chemo because before, before I went through this whole thing, I get behind the wheel, I, oh, I don't have time. Look, you, can't you see the light's gone green? I've got to rush because I've got to get from here. I've got to go to there. And I'd get worked up about stuff. And um, you drive the old Land Rover and you can't go anywhere fast. And no one, the other thing, so you can't go fast. And so life's got to slow down at the rate of the 1971 Series 2A. And, um, and that was real, that was a really good thing. It was, it's strange, isn't it? But I had to slow down to the rate of my 1971 Series 2 Land Rover, which was really slow, and you, it just doesn't go fast. And the thing about it is nobody toots you anyway because they know it's such an old thing. It's, it, was, it's sort of, it was sort of quite good. So, yeah, that, that's changed things a bit. I am, I've got to say, I am, look, I do find one thing I've certainly found is going through all this, it, it knocked my confidence really badly. When, when you do chemo, it doesn't, it, it has physical effects, but those physical effects also uh, um, are, are on the way your mind works. So there was some pretty, you probably remember, I, I was some pretty clouded days um, where I didn't, you know, I couldn't multitask. I, I took a long time to make decisions. I wouldn't want to have been driving heavy machinery, put it like, put it that way. Luckily, I was driving the Land Rover because you can't leave in quickly. Um, and it really knocks your confidence. And I think that I'm probably still suffering a bit from that. Um, I talked to a friend who'd been through through it all as well, and um, a couple of times he's had um, he's had to do a couple of rounds of treatment for lymphoma, and he said, "Yeah, it's the same same thing. It knocks your confidence, and um, but it also knocks other people's confidence in you. I think, uh, which is a real shame because um, people with and, and so, actually, I think your, your your opportunities to get involved in things might diminish because people think, oh, you know, he's had cancer, you know, he might not have long to go, or um, you know, it's screwed with his brain, or he's somehow or another damaged. Well, in fact, I think it's probably the opposite. You become you become a lot wiser. The wisest person I ever talked to uh, was a friend of mine that had uh, terminal cancer, and and um, you know, he could talk about things in a way that no one else could. Awesome. I think that's uh, wise advice. <laughs> um, so I know one of the things you've been doing lately is writing a, a bunch of articles, um, putting your mind in the in the public um, sphere. So if people want to want to follow you, what's what's the best method for doing that? No, I, I don't know. Look me up on Facebook. I'm on Twitter, but I don't really use it. Um, I, I guess I'd. Yeah, I'm, I'm there on Facebook somehow or another or just look out for my articles on stuff that I get published every now and again. Um, yeah. Or one of your 150 scientific articles if someone has some real time to burn. Yeah, I want to see what I, what, they want to see what I got, got involved in uh, over the years. Well, that's fine too. Um, that's a way to do it as well. But I'm, you just, just Google me. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, well, we appreciate you coming back on, Steve, and I'm sure we'll have you again. We've got some some other hot topics uh, that that could do with uh, your opinion. So, um, otherwise, enjoy uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Yeah, will do. Thanks very much. Always good to chat. All right. Thanks. See you later. See ya. All right, 
that was a really great show. We really appreciate Steve coming on and talking about his really personal details. Um, and I hope you found that insightful. Follow along with us on performanceadvantagepodcast.com where you can keep up to date with the show and our training course. And if you have any suggestions or tips for the show to help us improve the show, send that over to us and we are happy to take your advice on board. As always, if you can share the show with your friends, it really helps us get the word out and that helps motivate us to keep going and give you more information. 